The etymology of the word fascism stems from the Italian root fasciso, meaning bundle or group. Under fascism, the many people of a nation conceivably are united under a totalitarian head of state gathered into a unified whole working together for the advancement of the nation and more often than not the advancement of the race. While fascism was first identified in pre-war Italy, Adolf Hitler's obsessive control over the aesthetics of both the Nazi party and the nations they conquered came to define what a fascist looks like. Nazi pageantry, largely based on Hitler's merging of operatic grandeur with an idealized representation of European military history, brought thousands upon thousands of men and youth into communal spaces, creating an overwhelming sea of combative masculinity. The libidinal energies of these men, their physical bodies and desire for war, are united in service of the state, their will unto death. With the disillusion of individual identity comes the need to forge a new model of self. A body must be constructed, images produced, that reflect the physical qualities of this new state. How can man model himself in the image of the state if the state is not modeled on the image of a man? The visage of the head of the state alone cannot be enough. Icons spanning multiple media must be created that are worthy of veneration, of worship. Hitler knew too well the importance of culture in cementing his leadership and turned to architects and artists to craft the new physical ideas upon which his head of state was modeled. Ideas of racially pure, clean, and vital citizens, ones who were productive and committed, were necessary and appeared in various age ranges on propaganda posters and in sculpture. A racially pure body here is divine, its vitality granted by its perceived superiority in nature. Nazi physicians, with their escalation of eugenics and euthanasia, provided the signs to justify the racially entitled fascist. Physical imperfections became impurities, pathologies, and both the bodies that carried these degenerations and the art that represented these bodies were to be wiped out, removed from history. The executor of Hitler's ideals of pure art and architecture looked to the Greco-Roman idealization of the robust male form in art, architecture, and its relationship to the state as a foundation for moving forward and establishing some sort of historical legitimacy. Hitler so valued the visual history of ancient Greece that he forbade Athens to be bombed during Nazi expansion. The sacred, then, is not the state itself, but rather the purity upon which the state is built. This purity does not come from either from a god, but from some idea of nature, the aestheticized social Darwinism that informs movements of racial purity promotes that the fittest should not only thrive and conquer, but make graven images of themselves. The physical ideas of aggressive, robust masculinity are transmitted using desire. Brecker's sculptures are both to be seen and, and wanted by the potential fascist, and are ideally performed. The sculptures transmit the notion of the virile, militant body. They aren't static, and their divinity is conjured through both seeing and doing, doing being exercising and contributing to the Nazi cause. Brecker's statues can also be seen as votive images. That is to say, the bodies that are represented are both victims of the perceived oppression of German biological superiority that Hitler claimed was propagated by Jews and degenerates. These sculptures, like the votive images identified by Freiburg, are giving thanks for the newfound health and freedom of the German male, and can be seen as tributes to a struggle before it even has been won. The mechanisms here are obviously secular, but the impression is divine. A final note is the potential homoerotic energy that defines these and other Nazi propaganda imagery, something that I will delve into in a future essay.